Uh, thank you so much for inviting uh, me back. Uh, so when we gave the first talk, uh, we, we had just started this pro project. Now uh, we are going to concluding it soon. So I'm happy to be able to uh, have, the, I guess, the record of what were, what were our vision is and what we have done. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a specific uh, work that came out of this uh, rapid project on how to share public data, uh, public health data, while preserving privacy during pandemic. Uh, so it's clear that uh, sharing surveillance data for data-driven response uh, is very, very important. We use data for understanding how transmission happens. The data is used for simulating different interventions, what their impact would be. And also, of course, in many cases, and for future pandemics, we will be needing it to detect outbreaks early on. Now, the, the question is that whether we can directly share this data, especially whether we can directly share uh, individual patient level data, which would be useful for building different models. Uh, during the coronavirus uh, crisis, uh, we had also have some kind of data crisis in the sense uh, organizations were reluctant to share it, uh, and they were concerned about the privacy, rightfully so, and uh, this required them to carefully and time in a time-consuming way analyzing which data to be sh to share it in what format and how can it be made public for future use. So. And this is, uh, and one of the compounding challenges is that unlike traditional data sharing settings, we have a data set size that's changing every day because every day we may have new patients can be diagnosed and these new patients data may need to be shared. Uh, and also uh, for regulation purposes, there are additional challenges for uh, if you do HIPAA compliance, which is the uh, privacy legislation that governs uh, healthcare data. Uh, so some people are very comfortable with HIPAA safe harbor rules, which guarantees some certain regular uh, way to sanitize data, but the dates uh, are not allowed. And then this creates challenges for some of these end users. And of course, due to the emergency of the situation, we have to do this very fast. We have to share the data fast without really relative privacy. So in a sense, uh, we developed a framework where we can adapt to these number of records, number of patient records that are changing every day, and we can prioritize different specific information. Let's say you want to be more detailed with respect to age, but not less race, but or maybe you want to be more detailed on race, et cetera, while understanding privacy implications. So we developed this uh, risk estimation, privacy risk estimation framework. And the first part of it is that we looked into data generalization. In this work, we, we focus on the tools where we share the actual correct data that's being given, but at a less specified level or more generalized level. So what does more generalization mean is that, for example, in our framework, instead of for privacy reasons, instead of sharing someone's age, you may share the age range, like it says five to 10, or you can, if you want to protect privacy even more, you can share a higher range and it may go up to the top where you don't share any information. Of course, the leave notes are very precise, and the, but more privacy, uh, potential privacy issues, so less privacy protection. And when we go higher up, less information, but uh, more privacy protection. So the, the second thing is that in order to estimate the risks, we really look into the population distribution in different counties and whether, uh, especially for the risk we estimate in this work, called re-identification risk. In other words, an attacker who knows some information about the patients, can they re-identify in the data and know that, oh, this record must belong to Murat or this second must belong to John. So in order to do this estimation, we look at the census data and use the population distribution to identify it. The next setting is that once we get this uh, data, the time series cases, uh, like how many cases reported, the privacy risk metric, we will be using a specific one, which I will describe in a second. And uh, also how often, which we call window of size, how often we would like to share, share the patient records. We created this Monte Carlo simulation framework where we randomly select the population, 
we estimate the risk and we do this thousands of times to estimate the this uh, look at the risks and here we look at something called pk11 risk and we want it to be less than one percent which means that the percentage of records falling into demographic group of size 10 or smaller should be less than or equal to one percent in other words we are estimating that uh, less than one percent of the population would would be in a group of patients uh, less than size total size 11 or less than other 10 other records so given this risk estimation and this is kind of uh, based on what cdc is using so we try to look into uh, that risk basically used by cdc and we look at the distribution and based on these distributions we evaluate uh, uh, privacy uh, risk thresholds and the policies so in the experiments next I'm going to show, we use this PK-11 risk that I mentioned. We run the simulations for a thousand times and we look into 96 alternative policies and we do this across the counties and we do this uh, for each country by size and the number of cases. So what we get is that for small counties, when the epidemic starts and we have few cases, privacy risks are much higher than the accepted threshold we mentioned. So you can't really share any data. But as, as the time progresses, even in small counties, you won't be able to share much, but in bigger ones, at least from this risk point of view, uh, you could have many policies. For example, this diagram says that uh, if the county is between 50,000, one to 50,000 range, and we hit the total 5,000 cases, we would be able to find among the 96 policies we looked at, we would get 31 to satisfy the risk. And these policies are listed, some of them here, like how, how uh, fine grain we share the age, whether we had sex, nationality, race, and so on. In addition to that, we look into dynamic policy change. In other words, we, we don't stick to changing, we don't stick to sharing one type of data, but we evolve what we share all the time. And we compare this with uh, also uh, CDC static policies. In the CDC's case, it, com com uh, it divides the age into 0, 0,9, 10 to 19, and so on, these kind of intervals, like 10 year intervals. It, it has combined range and ethnicity, uh, gender, state of residence, and count of residence, and date of per specimen collection. So that's the CDC static policy in terms of data uh, sanitization used. Uh, here, we looked at whether our dynamic policy, which adapted based on the risk, could perform better, especially uh, for uh, we do like we, we, we do daily and weekly releases, basically. So I won't go into all the details, uh, but what happens is that static policies in most of the cases, whether it's a small county or a big county, turn out to have more number of releases where the risk privacy risk threshold is exceeded. So for example, uh, when we look at the 95, 95% quantifile for a small county with population size less than 1,000, we would be having for the period we look at, we would have 22 days that the, the risk is above the threshold. Uh, this is daily releases. And, but for dynamic policy, we had even zero. And of course, for 1 million, again, you see the same threshold. So this kind of showed that one policy about data release and what the format it is uh, may not be good. And we need to really adjust as the pandemic evolves. So in this study, uh, what we try to sh show you is that our dynamic privacy risk assessment framework can give much uh, and better results in terms of estimating privacy risks, and it can really adapt uh, to changing environments, which protect with, with better privacy and utility options. But of course, this work that now we are continuing uh, only look at the privacy risk. We didn't look into what's the different utility of these policies. In other words, in some scenarios where given privacy is acceptable privacy risk, we have uh, 40 different policies, but given the tasks, which policy is better, for example, for outbreak detection 
or which post is better for understanding the whether outbreak happening in some uh, race, for example. So we didn't really look into uh, those uh, very carefully. So I will stop here again. I would like to thank uh, NSF for uh, supporting us. And this is a joint work with uh, Vanderbilt uh, Medical School uh, and also a colleague from IBM. And we, this, the, what I presented in a very short amount of time, if you want more details, it's published at Journal of American Medical Informatics Association uh, just recently. So I'll stop here and then towards the end if there are any questions, I will answer live online. Thank you.